basically what we were taught very early on is that you don't give people money, you give them food, you give them time, um, you give them something of, of sustaining value. Um, over the years, how I've adapted that and, and what I talk to people and how I, you know, that there's a whole mix of people that are doing panhandling, particularly on the street corners. Um, a lot of those people are genuinely homeless and, and really need that help and can use the financial help. Um, but there are also a lot of people that are, end up living in halfway houses where they're required to go out and panhandle as a way to raise rent for the household. So you never know. You don't know what the story is. You don't know how the money will be used. Um, and so in my opinion, it's a lot better to support local organizations that are providing basic human assistance, food, shelter, clothing, emergency assistance, transportation, because then you're relying on people who work in that, in that endeavor to be able to assess what the problems are and how best to address those problems. And you know, in vir virtually every community, there's some kind of emergency assistance um, program helping homeless people. The Jesus, way oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When He is King, all wars will cease. May His peace begin with me. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Into a plow. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Into a plow. Gonna beat my sword into a plow. Christ is king in my life now. May his peace begin with me. In 2018, Los Angeles County and the city of Los Angeles, California spent millions of dollars to move over 20,000 people off the streets into permanent housing. However, in January of 2019, a reliable study indicated the number of homeless people had actually increased by 12% in the county and 16% in the city. How is such a thing possible? Most communities in Southern California fared even worse. Hello, I'm Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. Jonathan Hunter, who is often featured as a storyteller at the annual Church of the Brethren Song and Story Fest, conducted a workshop this year providing the realities facing the homeless of this country. Jonathan is not only a captivating storyteller, but he's considered an expert on the problem of homelessness and an expert on creating housing for the homeless. We met with Jonathan in the small community of Bridge, Oregon, the home of Camp Myrtlewood. And we asked Jonathan about his connection to the Brethren and how we became involved in working with the homeless populations. I, I grew up in the Church of the Brethren. Um, my father was a Brethren pastor um, for most of his uh, life. Well, he was ordained for his whole life and served in parishes all over the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> so both my father and mother were first generation, um, became Brethren and in high school and later years and then my dad as i said was a pastor and served congregations in idaho and california um, so yeah i grew up in the grew up in the church went to brethren college uh, went to bethany seminary and was actually myself in a parish ministry for about 10 years um, after seminary i served a congregation in walkersville maryland for about seven years, and then I was in Harrisburg at uh, Ridgeway Community Church for about four years. And it was uh, actually during that time that I realized that I was more invested in community ministry and working around it, the emerging issues related to homelessness and, and poverty. Um, so that was the point where 
it, it just also so happened at that time, um, my former wife and I were deciding to move back to the West Coast. And uh, so I took that opportunity to kind of really re redirect uh, my career. Um, and so at that point, <clears throat> when I moved to San Diego in 1987, I started out, uh, I worked with Episcopal Community Services, um, running a day center outreach program for homeless adults with mental illness. Um, and eventually developed all of the programs for that agency. Um, we did everything under the sun, had a couple, several hundred employees. Um, left there in uh, 2000 and went to work with the Corporation for Supportive Housing, really focusing on um, creating permanent housing solutions for people who are homeless and who have multiple health challenges and barriers to housing. The average experience that many of us have with the homeless is at a freeway off-ramp. We're faced with the awkward choice of trying to ignore them or giving them money which we fear will be used to buy alcohol and drugs. We wondered what Jonathan advises people to do about those who are carrying signs, panhandling, and wanting contributions. Actually, uh, I, I most often advise people to do what I was taught growing up. And, um, and you know, in my, in my household, some of my earliest memories of, as a very young child, we were at that point in Sacramento, and we would go down to what, what was Skid Row in Sacramento, and my dad volunteered, uh, the whole vol family volunteered at Mom's Mission. It was a gospel mission in Skid Row in Sacramento. And basically what we were taught very early on is that you don't give people money, you give them food, you give them time, um, you give them something of, of sustaining value. Um, over the years, how I've adapted that and, and what I talk to people and how I, you know, that there's a whole mix of people that are doing panhandling, particularly on the street corners. Um, a lot of those people are genuinely homeless and, and really need that help and can use the financial help. Um, but there are also a lot of people that are, end up living in halfway houses where they're required to go out and panhandle as a way to raise rent for the household. So you never know. You don't know what the story is. You don't know how the money will be used. Um, and so in my opinion, it's a lot better to support local organizations that are providing basic human assistance, food, shelter, clothing, emergency assistance, transportation, because then you're relying on people who work in that, in that endeavor to be able to assess what the problems are and how best to address those problems. And you know, in virtually every community, there's some kind of emergency assistance um, program helping homeless people. And I just really encourage people to invest in those programs. They all rely on donor dollars in addition to whatever kind of government assistance they might get. Many churches across this nation are supporting efforts to reach out to the homeless. And we asked Jonathan about his ideas and recommendations for their involvement. There are a lot of ways that churches are, are very individually connecting. The, the other thing that I've been encouraging a lot churches to do a lot in the last several years is to really take a close, hard look at their land. Um, you know, churches are uh, often landowners, and could that land be used to develop housing that's affordable to very low-income people, um, to develop permanent supportive housing for people who are homeless who have um, disabilities related to mental health or addictions? Um, you know, not, certainly not every church has the luxury of having land, but some do. Um, and it's a, cha it's a challenge, but there are also um, development partners, nonprofit housing developers in communities that will partner um, with local organizations that have access to land to figure out how to put it to use. Over the years, employment has changed so much, and Jonathan discussed that in his workshop. And he told us more about that problem. One of the biggest puzzling issues right now in Southern California is that in the city and county of Los Angeles, 
literally in 2018, we moved over 20,000 people off the streets and into permanent housing. And yet at the beginning of 2019, we have more people homeless than we did at the beginning of 2018. And, you know, there's a lot of frustration, but when you look at the, the basic economics of housing in Los Angeles over the last 20 years, the, you know, inflation adjusted cost of housing has gone up by over 30%. People's real wages have stayed flat or slightly declined. So what's happening in our society in many urban centers that are where we have very high cost housing markets is that people are falling further and further behind. And even though people have sometimes multiple jobs, their wages are so low they still can't afford um, the fair market or average rate rental housing in a community. Some of the things that we think we know about, about homelessness really have to do more with correlations than causation. So, for instance, a lot of people say, well, mental illness causes homelessness, addiction causes homelessness, etc. The reality is that the vast majority of people with mental illness, even severe mental illness, never become homeless. The vast majority of people with addiction issues, including very severe addiction issues, never become homeless. Um, veterans, the majority of veterans never become homeless. And there was the thing for a long time, particularly with when, when the majority of homeless veterans were from the Vietnam era, we said, you know, it's all related to PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Of all the homeless, not all the veterans, all the homeless veterans from the Vietnam era, less than 17% ever saw or were anywhere near combat. They're not homeless because of PTSD. Some of them develop PTSD after living on the streets for long periods of time because it's a very traumatic experience. But the, the vast majority of Vietnam era vets who became homeless never saw combat. Um, so it's a mili that's no longer true, by the way, because in the post-draft uh, post era, um, the nature of the military has dramatically changed. Um, in Vietnam era, everybody who did the cooking, the driving, the cleaning, the maintenance, were all draftees. They aren't there anymore. So all that support stuff is now done by Halliburton et al. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so in the current conflicts, if you go into the military, you're going into war. And not only that, you're going to go repeatedly. And there are a lot of um, homeless vets now from the current conflicts, current wars, who have been in combat multiple deployments. That was never the case up until the last 20 years. So, so even that has changed. But the reality is, you know, the vast majority even of uh, still of veterans who have been in combat don't become homeless. So it's not like those things cause homelessness. So what are the correlations? Well, and, and this, this, is, this research is, is a little bit old, but it, but it still pretty, seems to be pretty well sustained. So if you look at the, the whole population, and we're trying to figure out not necessarily what causes homelessness, but what are the risk factors? So of the total population in any given year, about 1% of the population in the United States will experience homelessness, which doesn't sound like much until you think, you know, 330 million, so 1% is what, 300,000 some people will experience homelessness in our country at some point during the year. Of people who are mentally ill, and including severe mental illness, about 3.5% of people with mental illness will experience homelessness. So you see, it's not, it's not that high a number. That being said, at any given time, when you take a snapshot of homelessness, so we do now what's called a HUD, United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, requires all communities at least every two years to do a point in time count. How many people are homeless in your community? And the thing about counting 
is it, it underrepresents what's called churning. So to explain it, if I were to go in this neighborhood, <laughs> I would probably find some homeless people within 10 miles of here, but be my guess. Uh, but pick a neighborhood. If you were to go out tonight and count the homeless people, and you find 100 people, and then six months from now, you go out and you count the homeless people, and you find 100 people, 80 of them would be different from what you found six months ago. Because the vast majority of homeless people are only homeless for short periods of time. But the people with mental illness and, and addiction issues, you'd find the same people six months from now as you found now. So that when you become homeless and, and you have those issues, you tend to stay homeless for longer periods of time. So actually, so what are other risk factors? Well, if you're poor, if you're living in poverty, six and a half percent will become homeless. So poverty is twice the risk factor for homelessness as mental illness. If you're a poor child under the age of 16, 9% will become homeless. If you're a poor black child under the age of five, 16% will be homeless over the course of the year. If you're a poor black woman between the years of 18, ages of 18 and 29, 12% will become homeless. So what's the single highest risk factor for homelessness? A poor black man between the ages of 30 and 49, 20% will be homeless at some point in the year. So, so those, are, those are risk factors for homelessness. Um, so, you know, when I, when I titled this workshop, one of the things that just has been a, a, a particularly big issue in California and in some other regional markets like Portland, um, Minnesota has had a 50% increase in homelessness in the last year. Um, and in Los Angeles, the, the, the city of Los Angeles has had a 12, I think it's the city's 12% and the county's 16% increase in homelessness. Even though in the last year, Quite literally, in Los Angeles, we moved over 20,000 people off the streets and into permanent housing. <coughs> and in Orange County, where, you know, which, which is right next door, they had a 45% increase in homelessness because they didn't move nearly as many people off the streets because they didn't have nearly the resources. The voters in Los Angeles voted in two major tax uh, measures, one in the city and one in the county, that generated hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to solve, address, solve homelessness. Um, some other communities, um, Portland and Seattle, have both had incre significant increases. Um, but again, there are a lot of communities in the United States that have actually functionally ended veterans' homelessness. And by functionally ended, <laughs> What it means is if a veteran who becomes homeless within a very short period of time will be off the streets. Only a very small number of veterans will remain chronically homeless in a lot of um, communities around the United States, including Houston was one of the very first uh, to achieve um, functional zero for veterans. That to me, the single biggest factor in driving homelessness in the United States is containerized shipping. So, um, containerized shipping. Virtually every city, particularly every big city, and certainly in the United States, but pretty much in the world, why is it where it is? A transportation hub. It's where goods come and go. For generations in the United States, there were many, many men who raised families at a lower middle class, not quite middle class, but not poor, but a lower middle class lifestyle, never having a full-time job. They were dock workers of one kind or another. They unloaded and loaded things, trains, ships, airplanes, etc. 
with containerized shipping, we eliminated all of that work. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, what we've done to the economic ladder in the United States is that we, you know, if you, you look at a ladder and there's, you know, a step every, uh, somebody in you know, construction, what are they, every 11. 10 inches? Right. Eight, 11. 11 inches? Yeah. I, they're short. <laughs> And so what we've done in our economy is we've taken out a bunch of the rungs. And the first rung, which used to be 11 inches off the ground, is now about 24 inches off the ground. And because not only have we eliminated all those low paying jobs, we've also eliminated all the low cost housing. So, you know, my, my favorite example of that is the old Roger Williams song, King of the Road, which some of us are old enough to remember. <laughs> No phone, no pool, no pets, rooms to let, 50 cents. In the 1960s, as late as the middle, late 60s, in every city in the United States, you could find flop house housing for 50 cents a night. So you could buy a week's worth of housing for $3.50. Minimum wage was a buck and a quarter. So all you had to do was find three hours worth of work and you could buy a week's worth of lodging. By 1988, when I was finally getting fully immersed in trying to deal with homelessness, minimum wage was up to $4 an hour, but the cheapest flop house, quote unquote, SRO housing in San Diego was $600 a month. It would take four and a half days of full-time minimum wage work to buy one week's worth of housing. So what's happened is also minimum wage has not increased along with inflation and the cost of housing has skyrocketed in part for some very good reasons because we changed the zoning laws. Flop houses were called flop houses because it was a place to flop and they were vermin ridden. Some of the ones in Nampa, Idaho when I was a kid had literally had dirt floors. Um, still in 1966. Um, and so we've, you know, we've, we've changed housing. We've insisted that it improve, but we've also made it more expensive. So uh, you, you all have heard about, maybe you haven't, SRO hotels, single room occupancy hotel. It means you get a bedroom and there's a bathroom down the hall. Um, we now have stopped building SROs because they're just, it's not a good way to live. So the minimum the minimum you can do is called urban, urban efficiency units or you know, studio apartments. And the minimum standard in Los Angeles is 250 to 300 square feet. And it has to have its own bathroom and at least a microwave oven. So <clears throat> for the last three years, I've been working with an organization that is building a 13 story building that will have 275 efficiency units for homeless and formerly homeless and a lot of them will be special needs housing for people who have been chronically homeless. How much per unit is it going to cost to build that? $580,000 a piece. Did you say 580? Yes, I did say. 580. In LA? in LA, per unit. in Skid Row, per unit, for a 280 square foot studio apartment. There, there's a great publication, there's a great organization called the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And they have done a study now for, I got too many years, called Out of Reach. So every year they look at um, rents, what, fair market rents, what's the median rents? And by, you know, back in 1987, 88, 89, when they were first doing this, they were able to identify a handful of counties in the United States where with a minimum wage job, you could afford an efficiency or one bedroom apartment. There ain't none anymore. The average fair market rent nationally for a one bedroom apartment is $970 a month. If you're on SSI, what you could afford is $231 a month. If you have one 
full-time worker earning federal minimum wage, you could afford $377 a month, which means you'd have to have three full-time jobs to afford a one-bedroom apartment. Um, the rent affordable to a full-time worker earning the average renter wage is $913, so you're close but that's significantly above uh, minimum wage. Uh, nationally, the one bedroom housing wage, what you would have to earn per hour with one job to afford it is $18.65 per hour. If you needed a two bedroom apartment, you need to come up with almost $23 an hour. So fast food workers make an average of $10 an hour. And these are the fastest growing job segments in, the, in our economy. Fast food workers, waitresses do slightly better than the people flipping the burgers. Personal care, who are they? Those are the certified nurses assistants that work in our senior housing that a lot of people like me are gonna rely on real quick. <laughs> Dang. Home health aides make out a little better than people working that. Janitors, and up 12 bucks an hour. General laborer and material movers, 13.78 an hour. Medical assistant. So you're not a nurse, but a medical assistant, the median is 16.38 an hour. So you still, as, even as a medical assistant, can't afford the average rent on a one bedroom apartment. So what do you need to be able to do that? A registered nurse, an RN, $35 an hour. General operations managers, $49 an hour. Ah, software, $50 an hour for computer engineering. We thank Jonathan Hunter for sharing his experience with us. And we thank you in advance for becoming involved in your local food banks, food pantries, and organizations helping those struggling in your communities. Get involved, make a contribution. Your contributions of food, time, and funding will certainly be appreciated. This is Brent Carlson for Brethren Voices, wishing you peace. The path he trod, the path he trod. all those who tread, all those who tread, the path he trod. The path all those who tread the path he trod shall be called the friends of God. May his peace begin with me. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way is the way of peace. When he is king, all wars will cease. May his peace begin with me.